let's face it, the Bible can be a little intimidating, can't it? Maybe you would love to know more about the Bible, but you're not sure where to start. Or maybe you've tried reading the Bible and a lot of it just doesn't make sense. Or maybe you just wanna learn how to start reading the Bible for yourself. This can be a very difficult book to understand. And really it's not one book. The Bible is a collection of 66 documents written over a 1500 year period by 40 different authors. And these authors ranged from kings to prophets, other leaders and, and people who personally knew and followed Jesus. And most of the subject matter is about ancient customs, people and events. It's no wonder many of us feel like we don't know the Bible very well. Well, we wanna help. So over the next few sessions, we're gonna talk about how we got the Bible, what's in the Bible and different ways to approach reading and studying the Bible. One of the questions I hear a lot is, how did we even get the Bible? And it's a fascinating question because not only does it fill us in on how these 66 documents that were written over a 1500 year period were put together to collectively form the Bible, but it also serves as a powerful reminder of how faithful God is. And so we're gonna look at this question in really two ways. One, how those 66 documents became the Bible, and two, how the Bibles that you and I read today came to be. So let's talk about the process of the Bible coming together. It's called the canonization of scripture. And so the canon of scripture, or this collection of documents, and we usually call them books, that the church has recognized as having divine authority in matters of faith and doctrine, was finalized at this meeting of church leaders in AD 397 called the Council of Carthage. And as you know, the canon includes the books of the Old Testament and the books of the New Testament. There are 39 books or documents that make up the Old Testament. These were all written between 1400 and 400 BC. And of course, they were written in Hebrew, the language of the Hebrew or Israelite people. In about 200 BC, some Greek scholars translated the Hebrew scripture to Greek. This translation was called the Septuagint. This is the scripture that Jesus and his disciples would have been most familiar with. And there was never really any debate about the Old Testament. New Testament writers claimed that the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures were sacred. The New Testament writers include about 300 direct quotes from the Old Testament and over 4,000 references to the Old Testament. This includes many quotes and references from Jesus himself. It's absolutely remarkable how often the New Testament writers reference the Old Testament. So there's no record of any dispute over these 39 documents that make up the Old Testament canon. Well, that leaves us kind of wondering about the New Testament. There are 27 books or documents that make up the New Testament. And these were all written between about AD 45 and 85. And the first century church immediately recognized most of these documents that make up our New Testament as having divine authority. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because they knew these authors. There were eyewitnesses still living who had seen Jesus crucified, buried, and resurrected to life again. So most of our New Testament was affirmed and accepted as scripture for the church in the first few centuries before we ever had a compiled Bible. Then in the fourth century, the church officially settled and finalized the canon of scripture with virtually no disputes. Now to be clear, these documents did not become authoritative because some church leaders met in Carthage and declared them authoritative. The church had already regarded them as divinely inspired scripture for hundreds of years. So what these church leaders did was they just formally compiled them into one collection that we call the Bible. Now, there were some criteria that had to be met in order for a document to be considered part of the New Testament scripture. The writer had to be an apostle, and an apostle is defined as somebody who was an eyewitness to Jesus alive after the resurrection, somebody who was chosen by the Holy Spirit, and somebody who had been given the ability to perform signs and wonders. So the writer had to be an apostle, or if they weren't an apostle, the personal testimony of a living apostle had to have affirmed the divine authority of the book. An example of that would be Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. He was not an apostle, but the Apostle Paul affirmed the authenticity of the books he had written. Another criteria is that the contents of the documents had to align perfectly with what the apostles taught. 
And the final criteria taken into consideration is that the book had to have widespread and continuous acceptance and usage by Christian churches everywhere. And so based on that criteria, we have these 66 documents compiled in one collection to make up our Bible. So that's how we got the Bible. Now, they didn't start cranking out leather-bound Bibles to send to bookstores and hotel rooms in the fourth century. As a matter of fact, right around that same time, Pope Damasus I commissioned a priest named Jerome to translate the Bible into Latin. And for almost a thousand years, the scripture was pretty much only accessible to scholars and church leaders. So this is where it gets really crazy though. In 1382, a guy named John Wycliffe decided the Bible should be available to everybody. So he made the first translation of the entire Bible from Latin into English. And then two years later, he had a stroke and died. Well, the church leaders didn't like that people could read the Bible for themselves because this meant less control over the people. They were so angry with Wycliffe that 43 years after he died, Pope Martin issued an order that his body be dug up and his bones burned. But his work inspired others to make the Bible available for everybody. Many of these scholars succeeded, but were killed for their tireless work. John Huss translated the Bible into Czech, but he was arrested for heresy and burned at the stake in 1416. William Tyndale made the first translation of the New Testament from Greek into English. He spent most of his time dodging English spies and Roman agents, but managed to complete his Bible. Copies were soon flooding into e England illegally. In 1536, Tyndale was arrested, charged with heresy, and burned at the stake. Now, Miles Coverdale came behind Tyndale and completed his work on the Old Testament. He wasn't executed, but he did spend most of his life in exile. And then John Rogers assembled what became the first English Bible for authorized public use in 1538. But he became the first blood on the hands of Queen Bloody Mary in 1555. In 1560, the Geneva Bible was completed. This was the first version of the Bible that added numbered verses to the chapters. And it was the first version taken to America. And then in 1611, King James of England ordered a new translation of the Bible to be made. What's really interesting is part of his reasoning. One of the notes in the margin of the Geneva Bible, right beside Exodus chapter 1, verse 19, suggested that the Hebrew midwives were justified in disobeying the king's order to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. And being the king, he didn't like that, so he called the Geneva translation the worst of all translations. And the result, of course, is what eventually became known as the King James Version. Now, this is the version of the Bible that I actually grew up reading. There weren't really any other notable English translations of the Bible after the King James Version until the 20th century. And then, mostly due to either political or religious conflict, more and more versions were created. But all of them were patched up and reworked versions of the King James Version until the 1970s, when two major translations were produced that were completely new works, translated from not only the ancient manuscripts that the church already had, but using more recently found older ancient manuscripts, some of which were discovered as recently as the 1940s and 50s. Most of the Bibles we have available in stores today are versions that have been published in the last 50 years. And you might ask, well, which one is the best? Which one should I read? Well, that question reminds me of this. Several years ago, my wife and I owned a small gym, and we had people ask us for advice all the time about diet and exercise. One of the most common questions we got was this, what's the best type of workout? And our answer was always the same. The best workout is the one that you'll do consistently. And so my answer to the question, which is the best Bible, is this. The best one is the one that you'll read consistently. I do want to warn you that there are some translations you ought to stay away from. Any translation that is written to support a group's agenda or belief that's already in place and is opposed to what Scripture teaches in other words, there's an individual or a group that already has a set of beliefs, and so they decide to write or rewrite scripture to support their set of beliefs, you ought to stay away from. The most well-known translation that falls into this category is the New World Translation. 
I personally read either the New Living Translation or the New International Version most of the time. But you might prefer a different version, and that's fine. The most important thing is not the version or the translation. The most important thing is knowing the God of the Bible and applying what he teaches through his word, which is the Bible. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 24. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. One great Bible that helps with applying God's word to your life is the Life Application Study Bible because it includes notes that make the Bible easy to learn how to apply. Well, it's great to know where we got our Bible because it's such a huge reminder of God's faithfulness. There are so many reasons why it's a miracle that we can go to pretty much any store and purchase a Bible today. Ancient manuscripts that somehow survived. People who lost their lives trying to make the Bible available. Political turmoil and religious turmoil and economic and military fallout all centered on the publication of the Bible. But here's the deal. Isaiah 46 reminds us of this incredible promise from God. He says this, I am God and there is none like me. My purpose will stand. And his purpose, as we'll see in the next session, is to rescue his creation and restore our relationship with him. And the way we know him and know how to have a relationship with him is through his word, the Bible.